Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to write a terrible, terrible, inexplicable wrong. Some of you have mentioned the dearth of videos that we've done about the composer Gabriel Faure. Oh, yes. Faure is a wonderful composer, really fantastic composer, an elusive composer, one who's hard to pigeonhole and hard to try and wrap your brain around entirely because his expertise lay more or less in song composition. He was a very, very, very great songwriter. And then chamber music, which is not, you know, that's a subset of a subset of the classical music universe. But it doesn't matter. I hadn't talked about him much, and so now we are going to talk about this thing. This is the Erato Foray edition, consisting of piano works, chamber music, orchestral and choral works, and of course, the ubiquitous Foray Requiem. And we're just going to go through it, 12 fun-filled Foray discs. And we'll go through it and see what's in here. It happens to be a very fine set. All of this stuff was on EMI. Remember EMI? That similarly sort of red label thing that was sort of an E and an M and an I instead of an E thingy here, which got sucked up into Warner and then regurgitated in this form. But there were there were some two for sets of the complete chamber music and the piano music and the orchestral works. They were all in their own little little two for packages and things like that. And so, you know, now they're all in one box. That is the way of corporate mergers, my friends. So let's see what's in here. Uh, it's really, it's, it's all lovely music. The performances are very well known. He still has not been recorded quite as frequently as he probably deserves to be, aside from that ubiquitous Requiem in all of its 400 versions. You know, there's the original chamber version and then the later more orchestral version and then the underwater version and the, the upside down version. You know, there's just millions of them. But let's talk about what's on this. None of it, by the way, was ever on Erato, which is fascinating. And it was really even funnier is that the thing that was on Erato, which is the opera Penelope, Penelope, if you want to call it that, isn't here at all. But they have it, and it's on Erato. Go figure. All right, disc one, Piano Works. Uh, piano Works are actually the first four discs. This is going to make our job very easy. This is going to be a quickie. I have a feeling this talk will breeze by if we're lucky. First, you get the Nocturnes, of which there are 13. There are also 13 Barcarolles and five Impromptus, four Vols Caprices, six Pièces Breves, three Romans Sans Parole, uh, one Mazurka. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Oh, some Preludes, the Ballade in F-sharp major, Opus 19, which also exists as an orchestral work for piano and orchestra, the theme and variations in C-sharp C minor, and that's the piano music. And this is all with Jean-Philippe Collard. It's a very, very good set. Now, since this, there have been quite a few recordings of the complete piano music. I mean, Faure's piano works have gained in popularity over the years. They are gorgeous. I have a particular fondness for this set of 13 Barker rolls. I think they're just great. I mean, they're so beautiful. Now, Faure's style, let's just sort of start with this, because you can hear the evolution of his style um, throughout his piano pieces, especially these big sets, the Barker rolls and the Nocturnes. He began as a sort of traditional-ish French romantic guy. I mean, we, we, it's, it's worth pointing out, you know, when he was born, what are his dates here? 1845 to 1924. So when he was born, Chopin was still writing piano music, and that was sort of Faure's model, at least initially. And when he died in 1924, yeah, I mean, he, there was jazz. There was, there was the second Viennese school. So it was quite, 
quite a life. The reason he didn't compose much is because he was too busy making a living as an organist and then later running the Paris Conservatoire. And so he was, and he was a very forward thinking guy. And his music is very forward thinking. It's quite progressive. It doesn't sound it. It, it. Some people may think that's a good thing, but that doesn't mean it's easy listening. It's actually very subtle, very sophisticated, especially harmonically. And the more you listen to it, the more you hear in it. But initially, at least, it can sound like something that should be kind of like traditionally romantic, but just isn't. And so it can be frustrating. But I think, I think if you give it the time and attention it deserves, it, it just is magical. It really is. It's, it's its own world. He had a completely unique style. And I, I mean, he was one of the few French composers who went and hung out seeing Wagner operas, who was never influenced in any way by Wagner. He just, he just was his own thing. And either you like it or you don't. Similarly, when we get to the orchestral pieces, he wasn't terribly interested in orchestration. He wasn't orchest interested in making big sound and in, you know, obviously colorful or virtuosic types of, of noises, but he encouraged composers as diverse as, as Ravel and, and Debussy. And, you know, it's really, it's really quite extraordinary who he was and what he did. He was respected and beloved by just about everybody. And so he didn't have time to write so much of his own music. But he was a remarkable composer. And I do think the piano works are the place to start. I really do, especially the Nocturnes and the Barcarolles. Give them a shot. They are as beautiful a set of piano pieces as anybody wrote in the 19th century, I mean, period. And you do hear the evolution in style, so it eases you into his more, his, his more mysterious later style. Some of the harmony that he d discovered and played with was just amazing, absolutely amazing. So, chamber music. Now, there are two violin sonatas, and there are, let's see, what else have we got? Two cello sonatas. He's one of the few composers who could write a great cello sonata that sounds like the piano and the cello belong together. I mean, they really work well together. And there's that fabulous arrangement of his Sicilienne for cello and piano, the one from Pelias et Melisande. I mean, that's a gorgeous tune anybody ever wrote. It's amazing. And then there are a bunch of short pieces, you know, for violin and piano. You know, a romance, a concert piece, a thingy, a hoogie, or what you call it, you know, and for cello and piano. Then there's a fantasy for flute and piano, and another, a couple of pieces for flute and piano. These are with Augustine Dumay, Augustine, Augustin Dumay, and Collard, and then Frédéric Lodéon and Collard, and on the cello bits. And let's see, what else have we got here? Oh, there's a piano trio, of course with all these same people, the Faure people. And then we have, ah, uh, the two piano quartets. These are glorious works. The piano quartets and the quintets are just magnificent. They are extraordinarily gorgeous pieces. The piano quartets are more passionate and spontaneously romantic. The quintets are more refined. And, and I, I just think they're wonderful. Faure was one of the great 19th century writers of chamber music. I mean, he was right up there with Brahms and Dvorak. He really was. I mean, he didn't write as much as they did, but what he did is absolutely top quality stuff. There is not a dud in the bunch anywhere. He was that kind of a composer, maybe because he didn't have that much time. So he was very careful and he did exquisite things. He really did. And now we're already up to CD9. Amazing, isn't it? The string quartet. He was working on it when he when he died. Actually, finished it. He didn't quite finish the editing of it because I have the critical edition, and you know it's it, it's fully complete, totally done. Uh, he might have wanted to add some dynamic nuances and some other things to it, but it's a very very elusive piece. I've used that word before, but it really applies to this quartet. Once you know your foray, try the quartet and see how it strikes you. It's, it's, it's very refined, and it has an almost spiritual spareness to it. I hate that word, but I don't know how else to describe it. I really don't. 
It's remarkable. Then we get some music for two pianos, the Dolly Suite, which is delightful. You can get it in an orchestral version too. And there's an intermediate intermed symphonique, a symphonic inter interlude. And let's see, what is this thing? Ah, his joint composition with Andre Messager, his good friend, the amazing Souvenir de Bayreuth, a two-hand fantasy based on themes from Wagner's Ring. And it's a hoot. It is just marvelous. If you don't know the Souvenir de Bayreuth, you're missing one of the, the great, great 19th century uh, bits of gentle fun. I think. And, you know, even if you're poking gentle fun at Wagner, it's hilarious because he had no sense of humor whatsoever about himself. So it's terrific to hear other people do it and do it so well. And let's see what else we got here. Oh, this is, this is with, by the way, uh, with Collard and Bruno Ruguto. Then we have orchestral and choral works. So orchestral works are as follows. The Ballad for Piano and Orchestra at F Sharp Major, we just talked about that, solo piano version. The Elegie for Cello and Orchestra, which also exists in a piano version. Uh, the Berceuse for Violin and Orchestra, the Fantasy for Piano and Orchestra. Uh, piano and Orchestra and Le Jin for Chorus and Orchestra to a text by Victor Hugo, yay. And oh, incidental music to the play Caligula. I'll bet that was fun. I mean, the incidental music is quite nice. The play must have been a hoot. It really must have been family entertainment there. Did you ever see I, Claudius? You know, the parts with Caligula? Whoa, baby. You know, and it's funny because Foray was really not the guy, I would think, to do. I mean, Richard Strauss could have done Caligula, but Foray? The music's beautiful. It doesn't matter. And uh, the prelude to Penelope, Penelope the opera, Beautiful, beautiful opera, by the way. Aaron Copeland admired it considerably. And then we get the CD 11, Peleus et Melisande, which is gorgeous. I did do a talk on settings of Peleus and a Melisande where I, I mentioned this work here. So so we have discussed some foray, by the way. And then there's Masque et Bergamasque, which is delicieux. And finally, Shylock, which is or incidental music. And that basically covers Foray's orchestral music, a lot of which he didn't even want to orchestrate. He just was not interested in orchestral music. And this was all written for the theater, at least for the most part. Then we get the Requiem and the Contique de Jean Racine, which I sang in high school glee club. Oh boy. Now the Requiem, these are all these performances, the orchestral and choral stuff are with Michel Plasson. And they're very good ones. They're very good. You know, Plasson with the Toulouse Orchestra could be kind of soggy and, uh, you know, not terribly disciplined and sort of like rhythmically slack and, well, you know, just basically not very interesting. But he does this music well. And these have been classic performances. They've just been out there for so long. Probably most of you who are, you know, have been sort of hanging around as long as I have, um, you may own some of this stuff. But the bottom line, the simple truth, and the truth is always best when it's simple, is that this is a great way to get your basic foray. It's cheap, the performances are really decent, and you know once you've heard it, if you hear stuff you like, you can, of course, branch out and buy, duplicate as much as you like. But I have to say, and we have to do a talk about it at some point, we're going to have to start going into the songs and we're going to have to talk about um, some of the, you know, Penelope and some of his other pieces because he really was a wonderful composer of vocal music and an exquisite songwriter. I mean, La Bonne Chanson and the Chanson Dev, and I mean, they're just, just gorgeous song cycles and fabulous individual songs, and there are more than a hundred of them. So uh, it, it, that was where his, his mastery really, really lay, and, and none of it is in here. Um, so there's plenty more of foray, just not big, splashy orchestral pieces. But get to know the piano music, get to know the chamber music, and uh, even more than the orchestral works, which I think are a lesser importance, um, this is a major legacy. It's an unassuming legacy, 
but a major legacy nonetheless. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Go grab your foray without delay. Take care.